Hello, and welcome back to Brendan Moyer's Playwright Corner, where I read plays, poems, or whatever's currently striking my fancy at the moment. Today we're going to be continuing reading some of J.M. Singh's plays, and today we're going to be reading The Tinker's Wedding, which is a comedy in two acts written between 1902 and 1907. There is a preface to this play. The drama is made serious in the French sense of the word, not by the degree in which it is taken up with problems that are serious in themselves, but by the degree in which it gives the nourishment, not very easy to define, on which our imaginations live. We should not go to the theatre as we go to a chemist's or a dram shop, but as we go to a dinner where the food we need is taken with pleasure and excitement. This was nearly always so in Spain and England and France when the drama was at its richest. The infancy and decay of the drama tend to be didactic. But in these days the playhouse is too often stocked with the drugs of many seedy problems, or with the absinthe or vermouth of the last musical comedy. The drama, like the symphony, does not teach or prove anything. Analysts with their problems and teachers with their systems are soon as old-fashioned as the pharmacopoeia of Galen. Look at Ibsen and the Germans. But the best plays of Ben Jonson and Moliere can no more go out of fashion than the blackberries on the hedges. Of the things which nourish the imagination, humor is one of the most needful, and it is dangerous to limit or destroy it. Baudelaire calls laughter the greatest sign of the satanic element in man, and where a country loses its humor, as some towns in Ireland are doing, there will be morbidity of mind, as Baudelaire's mind was morbid. In the greater part of Ireland, however, the whole people, from the tinkers to the clergy, still have life, and a view of life, that are rich and genial and humorous. I do not think that these country people, who have so much humor themselves, will mind being laughed at without malice, as the people in every country have been laughed at in their own comedies. J. M. Singh The persons are Michael Byrne, a tinker, Mary Byrne, an old woman, his mother, Sarah Casey, a young tinker woman, and a priest. The first production was in London on the 11th of November, 1909. Michael Byrne was performed by Jules Shaw, the priest by Edmund Gurney, Mary Byrne by Claire Greet, and Sarah Casey by Mona Limerick. The scene is a roadside near a village. Act One, After Nightfall A fire of sticks is burning near the ditch, a little to the right. Michael is working beside it, in the background on the left, a sort of tent and ragged clothes drying on the hedge. On the right, a chapel gate. Sarah Casey, coming in on the right, eagerly. We'll see his reverence this place, Michael Byrne. Any passing backward to his house tonight? Michael, grimly. That'll be a sacred and sainted joy. It'll be a small joy for yourself if you aren't ready with my wedding ring. She goes over to him. Is it near done this time? Or what way is it at all? A poor way only, Sarah Casey. For it's the devil's job making a ring. And you'll be having my hands destroyed in a short while, the way I'll not be able to make a tin can at all, maybe at the dawn of day. Sarah, sitting down beside him and throwing sticks on the fire. If it's the devil's job, let you mind it. And leave your speeches that would choke a fool. Michael, slowly and glumly. And it's you'll go talking of fools, Sarah Casey. When no man did ever hear a lion's story even of your like until this mortal day. You two be going beside me a great while and rearing a lot of them. And then to be setting off with your talk of getting married. And you're driving me to it and I not asking at all. Sarah turns her back to him and arranges something on the ditch. Can't you speak a word then when I'm asking what it is ails you since the moon did change? <laughs> I'm thinking there isn't anything ails me, Michael Byrne. But the springtime is a queer time. And it's queer thoughts maybe I do think it whiles. It's a hard set you'd be to think queerer than welcome, Sarah Casey. But what will you gain drag me to the priest this night, I'm saying, when it's new thoughts you'll be thinking at the dawn of day. It's at the dawn of day I do be thinking I have a right to be going off to the rich tinkers to be travelling from Tipperden to the Tara Hill. For it'd be a fine life to be driving with young Jaunt and Jim, and there wouldn't be any big hills to break the back of you with walking up or walking down. It's the like of that you do be thinking. The like of that, Michael Byrne, when there is a bit of sun in it, and a kind of air, and a great smell coming from the thorn trees above your head. Michael looks at her for a moment with horror, then hands her the ring. Will that fit you now? Sarah trying it on. It's making it tight, you are. And the edge is sharp on the tin. 
Michael looking at carefully. It's the fat of your own finger, Sarah Casey. And isn't it a mad thing I'm saying again and you'd asking marriage of me, or making a talk of going away from me and you thriving and getting your good health by the grace of the Almighty God? Sarah, giving it back to him. Fix it now and it'll do. If you wear it, you don't squeeze it again. <laughs> Michael, moodily working again. It's easy saying, be wary. As many things easy said, Sarah Casey, you'd wonder a fool even would be saying it at all. Ow! Devil mind you, I'm scolded again. If you are, it's a clumsy man you are this night, Michael Byrne. And let you make haste now, or herself will be coming with the porter. Michael defiantly raising his voice. Let me make haste. I'll be making haste maybe to hit you a great clout. For I'm taking us the like of you you want. I'm taking on the day I got above Toratvana, and the way you begin crying out and me coming down off the hill crying out and saying, I'll go back to my ma, and I'm taking on the way I came behind you that time and hit you a great clout in the lug, and how quiet and easy it was you come along with me from that hour to this present day, Sarah standing up and throwing all her sticks in the fire. And a big fool I was too, maybe. And we'll be seeing John and Jim tomorrow in Ballinaclash. And he after getting a great price for his white fall in the horse fair at Wicklow. The way it'll be a great sight to see him squandering his share of gold. And he with a grand eye for a fine horse and a grand eye for a woman. Michael working again with impatience. The devil do him good with the two of them. Sarah kicking up the ashes with her foot. Ah, he's a great lad, I'm telling you. And as proud and happy I'll be to see him. And he the first one calling me the beauty of Balanacri, a fine name for a woman. It's the like of that name they do be putting on the horses they have below racing in Arklo. It's easy pleased, you are, said Casey, easy pleased with a big word, or the liar that speaks it. Liar? Liar, surely. Liar, is it? Didn't you ever hear tell of the peelers follow me ten miles along the Glen Mauru? And they talk in love to me in the dark night? Or of the children you'll meet coming from school and they say one to another, It's the day we see Sarah Casey. The beauty of Balanacri, a great sight, surely. God helped a lot of them. It's yourself be calling God to help in two weeks or three when you'll be waking up in the dark night and thinking you see me coming with the sun on me and I driving a high cart with John and Jim going behind. It's lonesome and cold you'll be feeling the ditch where you'll be lying down that night. And I'm telling you, you'll be hearing the old woman making a great noise in her sleep and the bats squeaking in the trees. Psst. I hear someone come on the road. Sarah looking out right. It's someone coming forward from the doctor's door. It's often as the Rivens does be in there playing cards, or drinking a sup or singing songs until the dawn of day. It's a big boast of a man with a long step on him and a trumpeting voice. It's his reverence, surely. And if you have the ring done, it's a great bargain we'll make now and he have to drink in his glass. Michael going to her and giving her the ring. There's your ring, Sarah Casey. But I'm thinking he'll walk by and not stop to speak with the like of us at all. Sarah, tidying herself in great excitement. Let him be sitting here and keeping a great blaze the way he can look on my face. And let him seem to be working for the great love the like of him have to talk of work. Michael, moodily sitting down and beginning to work at a tin can. Great love, Shirley. Sarah, eagerly. Make a great blaze now, Michael Byrne. The priest comes in on right. She comes forward in front of him. Sarah, in a very plausible voice. Good evening, your reverence. It's a grand fine night, by the grace of God. The Lord have mercy on us. What kind of living woman is it that you are at all? It's Sarah Casey I am, your reverence. And it's Michael Byrne is below in the ditch. A holy pair, surely. Let you get out of my way. He tries to pass by. Sarah keeping in front of him. We are wanting a little word with your reverence. I haven't a halfpenny at all. Leave the rod, I'm saying. It isn't a halfpenny we're asking, Holy Father. But we're thinking maybe we'd have the right to be married. And we're thinking it's yourself would marry us for not a halfpenny at all. But you're a kind man, your reverence. A kind man with the poor. Is it marry you for nothing at all? It is, your reverence. And we were thinking maybe you'd give us a little small bit of silver to pay for the ring. Let you hold your tongue. Let you be quiet, Sarah Casey. I've no silver at all for the like of you. And if you want to be married, let you pay your pound. I'd do it for a pound only. And that's making it a slight cheaper than I'd make it for one of my own pairs living here in this place. Where would the like of us get a pound, your reverence? Wouldn't you easy get it with your selling asses? And you're stealing east and west and Wicklow and Wexford and the county Meath? He tries to get past her. Let you leave the road and not be plaguing me more. Sarah, pleadingly taking money from her pocket. Wouldn't you have a little mercy on us, your reverence? Holding out money. Wouldn't you marry us for half a sovereign? 
and it's a nice shiny one with a view on it of the living king's mama. If it's ten shillings you have, let you get ten more the same way, and I'll marry you then. Sarah, whining. It's two years we are getting that bit, your reverence. With our pence and our halfpence and an odd threepenny bit, and if you don't marry us now, himself and the old woman who has a great draught will be drinking it tomorrow in the fair. And then I won't be married at time, and I'll be saying till I'm an old woman it's a cruel and wicked thing to be bread poor. <sighs> Priest turning towards the fire. Uh, let you not be crying, Sarah Casey. It's a queer woman you are to crying at the like of that, and you and your whole life walking the roads. Sarah, sobbing. It's two years we are getting the gold, your reverence. And now you won't marry us for that bit. And we hard-working poor people do be making cans in the dark night and blinding our eyes and the black smoke from the bits of twigs we do be burning. <laughs> An old woman is heard singing tipsily on the left. Priest, looking at the can Michael is making. When will you have that can done, Michael Byrne? In a short space only, your reverence, for I'm putting the last dab of solder on the rim. Let you get a crown along with the ten shillings in the gallon can, Sarah Casey, and I will wed you so. Mary, suddenly shouting behind tipsily, Larry was a fine lad, I'm saying. Larry was a fine lad, Sarah Casey. Whist, now, the two of you. There's my mother coming. And she'd have us destroyed if she heard the like of the talk the time she'd be drinking her fill. Mary comes in singing. And when we asked him what way he'd die, and he hang in a repented. Begob says Larry, that's all in me eye, by the clergy first invented. Sarah, give me the jug now, or you'll have it spilt in the ditch. Mary, holding the jug with both her hands in a stilted voice. Let you leave me easy, Sarah Casey. I won't spill it, I'm saying I'm God help you. Are you taking its froth and fold to the brim at this hour of the night? And I have to carry it in my own two hands a long step from Jimmy Neal's? Michael, anxiously. Is there sup left at all? Sarah, looking into the jug. A little small sup only, I'm thinking. Mary sees the priest and holds out jug towards him. God save your reverence. I'm after bringing down a smart drop. And let you drink it up now for its middling draughty man you are at all times. God forgive you, and this night is cruel dry. She tries going towards him. Sarah holds her back. Priest, waving her away. Let you not be fallen to the flames. Keep off, I'm saying. Mary, persuasively. Let you not be shy of us, your reverence. Are we all sinners, God help us? Drink us up now, I'm telling you. And we won't let on a word about all of it till judgment day. She takes up a tin mug, pours some porter into it, and gives it to him. Mary, singing and holding the jug in her hands. Lonesome ditch in Ballygun, a day I'll be in a ten penny can. A lonesome bank in Ballytuff, the time you... It's a bad wicked song, said a Casey. And that you put me down now in the ditch, and I won't sing it till himself will be gone, for it's bad enough he is, I'm thinking, without our cells making him worse. Sarah putting her down to the priest, half laughing. <laughs> Don't mind her at all, your reverence. She's no shame the time she's a drop taken. And if it was a holy father from Rome was in it, she'd give him a little sup out of her mug and say the same as she's said to yourself. Mary to the priest. Lay a drink it up, holy father. Let you drink it up, I'm saying, and not be letting on you'd want the like of it. And you, with a stack of pint bottles above, reaching the sky. Priest with resignation. Well, here's to your good health. And God forgive us all. He drinks. That's right now, your reverence, and the blessing of God be on you. Isn't it a grand thing to see you sitting down with no pride in you and drinking us up with the like of us, and we the poorest, wretched, starving creature you'd see in any place on earth? If it's starving you are itself, I'm thinking it's well for the like of you to be drinking when there is a draught on you, and lying down to sleep when your legs are stiff. <sighs> what would you do for the like of myself you were, saying mass with your mouth dry, and running east and west for the sick call maybe? and hearing the rural people again, and they say in their sins. Mary with compassion. 
It's destroyed you must be here in the sins of the rural people on a fine spring. Priest with despondency. It's a hard life, I'm telling you. A hard life, Mary Byrne. And there's the bishop coming in the morning, and he an old man would have you destroyed if he's seen anything at all. Mary with great sympathy. It'd break my heart to hear you talking and sighing the like of that, your reverence. She pats him on the knee. Let you rouse up now. If it's a poor single man you are itself, and I'll be singing your songs until the dawn of day. What is it I want of your songs when it'd be better for the like of you that'll soon die to be down on your two knees saying prayers to the almighty God? <sighs> if it's prayers I want, you'd have a right to say one yourself, Holy Father. For we don't have them at all, and I've heard tell a power of times it's that you're for. Say one now, your reverence, for I've heard a power of queer things, and I walk in the world. But there's one thing I've never heard any time, and that's a real priest saying a prayer. The Lord protect us. It's no lie, Holy Father. I often heard the rural people making a queer noise and then go on to rest. But who'd mind the like of them? And I'm thinking it should be a great name to hear a scholar the like of you speaking Latin to the saints above. Priest scandalized. Stop your talking, Mary Byrne. You're an old flagrant heathen, and I'll stay no more with a lot of you. He rises, Mary catching hold of him. Stop till you say a prayer, you weapons. Stop till you say a little prayer, I'm telling you, and I'll give you my blessing in the last sup of the jug. Priest breaking away. Leave me go, Mary Byrne, for I've never met your like for hard abominations to score in two years I'm living in the place. Is that the truth? It is, then. And God have mercy on your soul. The priest goes toward the left, and Sarah follows him. Sarah, in a low voice. And what time will you do the thing I'm asking, Holy Father? For I'm thinking you'll do it surely, and not have me grown into an old wicked heathen like yourself. Mary calling out shrilly, Let you be walking back here, Sarah Casey, and I'll be talking whisper talk with the like of him in the face of the Almighty God. Sarah to the priest, Do you hear her now, your reverence? Isn't it true, surely, she's an old flagrant heathen would destroy the world? Priest to Sarah, moving off. Well, I'll be coming down early in the chapel, and let you come to me a while after you see me passing, and bring the bit of gold along with you and a tin can. I'll marry you for them too, though it's a pitiful small sum, for I wouldn't be easy in my soul if I let you grow into old wicked heathen the like of her. The blessing of Almighty God be on you, Holy Father, and that he may reward and watch you from this present day. Mary, nudging Michael. Did you see that, Michael Byrne? Didn't you hear me telling you she's flighty a while back since the change of the moon? With her fussin' for marriage and she making whisper talk with one man or another along the road. Whist now, or she'll be knocking the head off of you the time she comes back. Ah, it's a bad wicked way the world is this night. And there's a fine error in itself. You never have seen me and I, a young woman, making whisper talk with the like of him. And he, the fearfulest old fellow you see in any place walking the world... Sarah comes back quickly, Mary calling out to her. What does he have to whisper about with himself? Mary, exultingly, lie down and leave us in peace. She whispers with Michael. Mary, poking out her pipe with a straw, sings, She'd whisper with one, and she'd whisper with two. (coughs) (coughs) My singing voice is gone for this night, Sarah Casey. She lights her pipe. But if it's flight you are itself, you're a grand, handsome woman, the glory of Tinkers, the pride of Wicklow, and the beauty of Ballinacree. I wouldn't have you lying down and you lonesome to sleep this night in a dark ditch where the spring is coming in the trees. So let you sit down here by the big bow, and I'll be telling you the finest story you'd heard any place from Dundalk to Ballinacree with great queens in it making themselves matches from the start to the end, and they with shiny silks on them the length of the day, and white shifts for the night. Michael, standing up with a tin can in his hand. Let you go to sleep, and not have us destroyed. Mary, lying back sleepily. Don't mind him, Sarah Casey. Sit down, and I'll be telling you a story would be fit to tell a woman the like of you in the springtime of the year. Sarah, taking the can from Michael and tying it up in a piece of sacking. that will not be rest now in the dews of night. I'll put it up in the ditch the way it'll be handy in the morning. And now we've done that, Michael Byrne, I'll go along with you and welcome for Tin Flatterty's hens. 
She puts the can in the ditch. Mary, sleepily, I've a good story of the great queens of Ireland with white necks on them, the like of Sarah Casey. And fine arms would hit you a slap the way Sarah Casey would hit you. Sarah, beckoning on the left. Come along now, Michael, while she's fallen asleep. He goes towards the left. Mary sees that they are going, starts up suddenly, and turns over on her hands and knees. Mary, piteously. Where is it you're going? Let you walk back here and not be leaving me lonesome when the night is fine. Don't be waking the world with your talk when we're going up through the backwood to get two of Tim Flatterty's hens or roosting in the ash tree above at the well. And it's leaving me alone you are. Come back here, Sarah Casey. Come back here, I'm saying. Or if it's off, you must go. Leave me with two little coppers you have. The way I can walk up in a short whale and get you another pint for my sleep, it's too much you have taken. Let you stretch yourself out and take a long sleep, for isn't that the best thing any woman can do? And she an old drinking heathen like yourself? She and Michael go out left. Mary, standing up slowly. It's gone, they are. And I, with my feet that weak under me, you'd knock me down with a rush. And my head with a noise in it, the like you wouldn't hear in a stream, and it running between two rocks and a rain falling. She goes over to the ditch where the can is tied and sacking and takes it down. What good am I this night, God help me? What good are the grand stories I have when it's few would listen to an old woman? Few but a girl, maybe, would be in a good fear the time her arrows come. Or a little child wouldn't be sleeping with hunger in a cold night. She takes the can from the sacking and fits in three empty bottles and straw in its place and ties them up. Maybe the two of them have a good right to be walking out the little short while they'd be young. But if they have itself, they'll not keep Mary Byrne from a full pint when the night's fine and there's a dry moon in the sky. She takes up the can and puts the package back in the ditch. Jemmy Neal's a decent lad and he'll give me a good drop for the can. And maybe if I keep near the peelers tomorrow for the first bit of the fair, herself won't strike me at all. And if she does itself, what's a little stroke on your head besides sitting lonesome on a fine night, hearing the dog sparking and the bat squeaking and you saying over, It's a short while only till you die. She goes out singing the night before Larry was stretched. Curtain.